Hello, everyone, and welcome to the session. Today is the second in a series of starting a food co-op, what you need to know. Today's session is Capitalizing Your Co-op with Bill Gessner and Tammy Bowers. Today we'll be providing an opportunity for you to ask your own questions to the presenter. If you'd like to participate, please type your question into the question box on the control panel. I'll be moderating those questions and identifying questions that will be useful to the full group, and we'll do our best to answer all the questions that come in, either by the presenters or we'll be typing a response back to you. If you're calling on a telephone, be sure you've entered your audio PIN so that we can unmute you and allow you to ask your questions. The next in the series of webinars will be um, market, uh, understanding your market analysis, and that will be by Debbie Swasuna two weeks from today. If you haven't signed up for that session, we hope that you will. Um, and at, at the end of the session today, there will be an evaluation. Um, when the session is over, uh, just stay on for one moment, and the questions will appear. We'd very much appreciate you your taking about five minutes to complete those. It helps us make sure that we're designing uh, materials that really meet your needs. In addition, today's materials and recording will be available on our website, cdsconsulting.coop. Uh, just look on the left-hand toolbar for news and events, and then follow the links uh, for starting a food co-op, what you need to know, and look for the recordings and materials from today's session. Uh, with that, I think we're ready to go. Again, if you have questions, uh, type in uh, your questions in the question toolbar on the right. So, uh, Bill, can I turn it over to you? Yes, you can. Thank you, Marilyn. Uh, greetings, everybody, and welcome. I'm very glad you're joining us today and uh, for our second in a series of six webinars. And our focus today is on capitalizing your co-op. Uh, we're going to look at capital from uh, a couple of different perspectives. But initially, we're going to look at we're going to look at it internally raising capital internally within your co-op and also raising capital externally. And another way to look at what we're going to be talking about today, we're going to be talking about capital, raising capital as debt and raising capital as equity. And uh, you see the agenda here in front of us. Uh, we have a lot of material to cover. The slides that we have for you today we will not be getting going through all of the slides in our presentation, but we thought that the information in the slides might be useful to you uh, as an additional resource. Uh, we will use certainly use some of the slides, but we will not cover all 35 slides here in an hour. We want to have time for questions and discussion and interaction. Um, so our desired outcomes for the day are, are listed here. Uh, gaining an understanding of what are the ways in which you can capitalize your co-op and um, how might you plan and implement a, and, and implement a plan to uh, raise various sources of capital and what are some effective strategies for doing so. Um, we have a guest presenter with us today. Um, we have Ben Sandell who is the president of the Friendly City Food Co-op in Harrisonburg, Virginia. And I'll ask Ben to introduce himself in a little bit, and he'll give you a description of his co-op, and we'll come back to this slide. And we have Tammy Bowers, uh, who will be co-presenting with me. And uh, Tammy is part of the CDS Consulting Co-op, and her specialty is kind of in the area of member loans and member equity helping co-ops uh, develop plans and implement plans to raise uh, member equity and member loans. And uh, Tammy has worked with a number of uh, established food co-ops, and, and um, we look forward to hearing from her today, uh, especially in the areas of member equity and member loans. Um, the, um, just as a very brief refresher, the um, the development model that is available on the Food Co-op 500 website and on the uh, CDS um, um, Consulting Co-op website is the four cornerstones and three stages. Our last webinar focused on 
uh, the cornerstone of vision and building a shared vision. And our, our webinar today will, will focus on the cornerstone of capital. Uh, additionally, there's the cornerstone of talent and the cornerstone of systems, uh, suggesting that it's important to recognize and develop these four cornerstones throughout the entire process of organizing your co-op, uh, assessing feasibility and developing a plan or a business plan, and going into the implementation stage where you eventually open your, your co-op. Uh, so the importance of capital is, is our theme for the day. Uh, we can look at capital and um, we can capitalize uh, on our on the topic here with a capital C and um, capital is defined as money or property that is used to produce more wealth and um, some of us might really like capital and some of us might even disdain it but it is uh, a reality and if a, if a cooperative is going to uh, pursue and fulfill and achieve its mission or purpose or ends um, the, it is you have to have capital and um, uh, cooperatives are capitalized initially by the members and it, there's kind of education that is involved for people to really understand what a co-op is a cooperative owned by its members. Members have a responsibility to capitalize their co-op. Um, the uh, co-op begins with a C, as does capital, as does cooperation, as does collaboration, as does community. And all of these things come together under a capital C. Um, if we, just to get a broad overview and a broad understanding of capital and how it works, uh, it, and it takes a while to, to absorb some of this, but uh, if you will, your, your cooperative will have uh, some financial statements, it'll have a balance sheet, and it'll have an income statement as it, as it comes into operation. Uh, the balance sheet is always in balance. There's an equal sign, and the basic formula for the balance sheet is assets equals liabilities plus equity. Uh, assets can be viewed as, as the what we have. Liabilities can be viewed as what we owe, and equity can be viewed as what we own. Um, so the what we have side of the of the equation equals the uses and those examples of that include cash and inventory property equipment and miscellaneous these are all things that the co-op has um, how do they acquire these things they acquire them by getting capital in the form of either liabilities or equity, and the the what we owe plus what we own are the sources. So the sources are the capital, uh, accounts payable, notes payable, member equity, and retained earnings are the common sources. So to beginning to understand that there is a balancing effect in here that assets equals liabilities plus equity. So we'll talk about sources of capital today that come from liabilities and debt and sources of capital that come from equity. Uh, when you think of as you buy a home or buy a house and you build up your equity position in it and the bank debt hope hopefully will shrink, um, that's the same thing that we have with the co-op. So. The uh, three primary sources of capital uh, can be viewed as um, the owner's contribution as, as the initial source, and that capital comes from member equity, member loans, basic fundraisers and donations. It comes in the form of income, right? 
uh, and grants, any grants that might be awarded to the co-op also coming in as income. The, any equity or loans that come into the co-op do not come in as income. They go directly to that balance sheet. Um, in contrast to donations, fundraisers, and grants. The second category, the second source of capital, we would refer to as external, outside of the co-op, but subordinated. And you'd ask, what does that mean, and subordinated to what? It's typically subordinated to the first position, or the primary debt, or sometimes what is called the bank debt. Um, the so all of the, the owner's contribution would typically be subordinate to any of the external capital. And then there would be a, a category sometimes referred to as the gap that connects the owner's contribution with the first position. So thinking of these three sources of capital uh, as, we, as we work through our hour here. Uh, why would members invest capital in their co-op? This is very important to, to understand this and to work to create a situation with your co-op where members will want to invest capital. Uh, they do so because they trust uh, that investing in the co-op will be in their own interest as well as the interest of other members. Um, Co-ops own earn this trust from their members. When the members perceive it as an effective agent for themselves, dedicated to serving member owner needs, um, so that is that is key building building that trust relationship. Capital is is important from a number of viewpoints. Um, it's the financial resource to pay for what is needed to run the business. It helps finance the growth of the cooperative, and certainly as a startup co-op, you're, you're, you're growing from day one. And more often than not, co-ops tend to be undercapitalized, and a shortage of capital puts a strain and a stress on the organization and results in unreliable equipment, inadequate facilities, cash shortages, inability to serve members, and a poor image and an inability to operate profitably. It's always been kind of ironic to me that, that cooperatives owned by their members, consumer-owned co-ops, potentially having a large membership base uh, one of the somewhat chronic weaknesses of food co-ops is that they tend to be undercapitalized. And so thinking through this in your, startup in your startup process to make sure that you educate your members on the importance of, of being fully capitalized before you open your doors. Um, in summary, we've talked about cooperative capital as debt capital and as equity capital. We'll get in, into this in more detail here as I begin to turn it over to Tammy here in a moment. Um, and you'll want to develop a capital plan. Um, so there's, there's a process in terms of planning, financial planning, uh, developing a capital plan that as you, as you understand more of this that you'll be able to work your way through. Um, Tammy, just before we get into talking, going into the member equity portion, the equity capital, uh, I would like to have Ben just introduce himself just a moment and uh, go back to the slide number three, I think it is, or number four. And uh, Ben, are you there? Yes, I'm here. And Ben, could you give us just a short introduction of, of your, your co-op in uh, Harrisonburg, Virginia, and where you're at? And uh, we have a slide up here that shows some of the data, so you may not need to go through all of that. Okay. 
Sure. Yep. Um, thanks for having me. We are uh, we've been working on it about four years now, and we're Harrisonburg is in the Shenandoah Valley on the western side of Virginia. We have about forty thousand people here, um, and uh, we have done. I think we've been real pleased with our growth in the number of members. That was a r real primary focus for a while. Now we're trying to turn to. Um, the member loan campaign. Uh, we have already achieved our primary financing, um, and we're uh, so now the big the big challenge is making sure we can get the member loan campaign in place uh, and fulfill that too. Um, as you see there, we've got about 210. We're about a third of the way there, so we're working on that. Great. Okay, so that's a picture, uh, an example of a, of a co-op uh, startup co-op that's been at it for about four years and. See that they at this point have um, 764 members with the goal of having at least a thousand by the time they open, and that they might be open as early as November of 2010. But we don't know yet if they will make that date. Yeah, chances are it'll be a little later. I think. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, so thank you, Ben. And we'll have some hear from you later, and we'll have some questions I'm sure directed to you. Um, Tammy Bowers, are you here? Yes. <laughs> and would you like to take it over for a little while? Sure. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, member owner shares or the equity that's brought in by someone becoming a member owner and purchasing shares. Um, this is um, a big part of your capital base, and you should think of it as sort of the first bricks of your co-op. Um, that all, all things will kind of build off of these member owner shares. Um, you are going to create um, a sense of ownership. So this idea of educating people about what it means to be a co-op member. We use the word member, but what we, what we really mean is an owner of the co-op. And so you'll be kind of uh, educating and creating the sense of ownership from the very start of your co-op, which will help you all throughout um, the lifetime of your co-op. Um, it also provides the co-op with an adequate capital base. So not only does it bring in money just in people buying the shares to become members, but it's, the other money is going to build on that money. So when you're getting members, those members are potentially lenders. Um, so they'll potentially be doing uh, member loans. And then also you'll be showing to your community, uh, to banks, to outside lenders, that you have um, this sense of community and this body of people that believe in the project and are willing to become member owners. Um, this, this type of capital has an advantage and disadvantage. Um, I only see advantages, of course, in this case, but uh, it's not taxable to the co-op. So when you're starting up a co-op, sometimes you might be taking donations or getting other types of money that are considered income and are taxable to the co-op. But all the member share money that comes in is not taxable and um, is just equity. It shows nicely on your balance sheet as you're trying to go out and get other funding. Um, and this uh, fourth point here on the third bullet, this many people provide relatively small amounts that can add up to a sizable base of funds. You know, you can see that in Ben's, you know, Ben's case with his startup co-op that he has, you know, they have 764 members and that's provided a nice amount of money uh, that they've built on from there. And then, of course, it demonstrates this, this show of support, how many people are out there and want the co-op to open its doors. So, so you'll be able to show that with those shares. Uh, Bill, you can move on to the next slide. Um, so again, you're going to um, want to contribute to an adequate capital base. You're going to want to be able to have this piece fully help capitalize your startup co-op. Um, 50 to 20 percent of the member owner capital, so a combination of loans and shares, uh, should add to about 50 percent. We'll talk more about that in a minute. But you're going to want about 15 to 20 percent of the total uh, member owner capital to come from these shares. Um, you're going to want your program to be flexible, so um, it's actually easier as a startup co-op. Um, you get to structure how you talk about things now. You don't have a, some of the established co-ops I've worked with still struggle with how they talk about it because some people still say, oh, it's a lifetime membership, and um, but you don't want to say that. You want to really allow for the fact that whatever, as owners, whatever capital needs your co-op has, throughout its lifetime, um, they're responsible for that. So if there's needs in the future to either 
expand your co-op or if you have equipment issues or a leaky roof or something, you're going to want them to know that they're, as the owners of the business, are responsible for that. So you want your, your member only shares program to be flexible. Um, I know for startups, they often want to talk about payment plans or in people's communities, how will people be able to afford it. We'll talk a little bit more about that, but you can use payment plans to accommodate different financial situations uh, in that case. And you're going to want it to be really a simple structure. You're going to want to be, to be able to talk about it simply. So when you're in the community, you're going to want to be able to say, um, you know, a membership, your share uh, is just a dollar amount and this is how you pay for it. You don't want to have to talk about it too much. You're going to want to just really be able to state it very simply. Um, you're going to want to minimize fees. So some people will say, well, well, we'll do a payment plan or we'll do this with an administrative fee. Um, you're going to either want to make that a very small fee, just maybe to cover the costs, um, or you're going to want to eliminate it entirely because it's kind of one more layer and one more cost to talk about. But, but if you feel you need to have one as a startup in order to finance um, payment plans or the like, then just make sure that it's small. And then your program should, um, thinking of the future, you're only going to want to change your program or the cost of membership uh, with the members understanding and support. And hopefully that's not going to be the case as a startup. You won't have to change how much it costs to be a member owner and, until further down the line. Bill, you can go on to the next slide, please. This is, I'm not going to really get into great detail about this. As you're working with um, your lawyer to structure your program, you, you need to know that the member owner's share is refundable. Um, so you're going to want to make sure that you kind of understand that piece. Um, and as a startup co-op, you're not really going to want to be refunding memberships, especially in the beginning. So you, you're going to want to you know, just allow language that says if someone wants to refund their membership, there has to be money that comes in to replace it or is already there. So just make sure you're talking with your uh, lawyer and amongst yourselves about what that looks like. But hopefully you won't have anyone wanting to refund their memberships at this point. Bill, you can move on to the next slide. Mm -hmm. So throughout the country, there's you know, innumerable structures <laughs> for people to become members at co-ops, different payment plans and different, different ways people have it structured. Um, I'm just going to simply talk about two. Um, and this first one um, is what I call the initial share purchase. This is where someone just has an initial amount of shares or initial amount of equity to put into the co-op. So to become a member owner, it's $200, for example. Um, again, it's not a lifetime thing, but, but that's what it would take to, to join. Um, that's like, for example, Ben's co-op, that's, that's what their membership costs right now. And it, for many startups, I'm hearing in that dollar range. Um, and that's... Um, you know, you should be structuring what it costs based on what your capital needs are to start your co-op or the cost of your project. Um, but this is, this is a pretty common amount, so I'm just going to use it as an example. And of course, you can set up uh, longer payment plans for people that you feel need it. Um, in this case, no one would need to buy an additional share, so you say, okay, it's $200, that will capitalize, that'll give us enough capital to, to do our project, and assuming that it would get you through, you know, the years of your co-op, the first years of your co-op, that nobody would need to give you any additional capital um, as you move for the first years of opening the doors of your new store. So um, there might be a time in the future, though, that the board would say, you know what, we're, you know, our balance sheet isn't looking good, or we have to do the, some expansion, or we need some new equipment, and they might say, okay, you know what, we need our owners to increase this membership cost of this $200. So um, we, we need people to invest further into the co-op, so maybe they'd have to buy an additional $25 worth of shares, and that's what it would take to be an active member. So that's one example, and that's a common one. This other example is where you'd have this initial shares put in, but then you'd have an annual uh, share purchase of, say, $25 per year. So that as a board and as a co-op, you know you'd have an ongoing source of capital from your members. Um, that would be coming in annually each year for someone to stay active. Um, this is an ongoing, it would build you an ongoing source of capital. So it's, it's something nice for the future. It wouldn't get you into a situation where a number of years down the road, maybe when your member loans come due, you'd say, 
wow, we're really we're short on capital right now, and um, and you wouldn't have to go back and try and increase your initial share purchase like in the previous example. Um, it takes a little more administration to do that, so people would have varying amounts of shares that they would own. But um, Bill, did you, are you speeding me up? Well, a little bit, yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. So then um, this is a startup example, and you can uh, really look this over. This is just an example of how you would arrive at your the cost of your shares. Um, so that's kind of one of the ways we got to the 200. This co-ops. In this example of what it would cost, it was $150,000 would divided by a thousand members by startup would be um, 150 plus an additional 50 for the future to arrive at the 200. So, so Tammy, one comment I would make here related to this is that as I work with a lot of the startup groups, I hear that as they're trying to figure out how much to what a member share should cost, they're kind of looking at it from the perspective of you know what can we get away with, or you know how much are, how much can we ask for from people, and you know that's that might be one approach, but I think you really need to look at it from an example similar to this, where you're looking at your your long your capital needs both for getting open and even your long term capital needs, and you know how many potential members might you have for a store size you're looking at, and how much of your overall capital might you be able to source from your members versus having to source from debt. And so this is just a quick sketch, but you know we can work with you in more your co-op in more detail to try to figure out something that would be appropriate for your group. So um, yeah, I mean it's it's important to do the math. <laughs> as Bill likes to say, I mean you need to know what what does your project cost and what what percentage of that needs to come for your members, and that's going to be the, how you'll calculate how much your membership is. Yeah. And, and we should probably move on to talk a little bit about um, um, this is a slide that shows, and we've shown this in different webinars, the different stages, and how many members you might want to have at the different stages prior to opening, culminating in 1,000 members. Um, and we'll, um, but we have some information in here about preparing to sell memberships, um, but I don't know that we have time to go through it in, in much detail here because we want to talk a little bit about member loans and have you understand the relationship between member equity and member loans. But there are some good basic tips here and how you can begin to sell sell memberships. And you need to think of it as it's kind of a selling mentality. You have to tell a story. You have to convey the vision and the concept that you have for the food co-op and begin to put it out to your community and begin to build your, your member base, not just from people who are interested uh, in a food co-op or people who want a food co-op, but people who are willing to invest to make that happen. Um, and the energy that can come forth when people start signing up uh, to be a member and putting their capital in, and the energy and the momentum that you begin to build is, is really important. Um, member loans um, in relationship to member equity, I like to think of it as thinking of member, member equity is from a large number of people and it's small, relatively small amount of money, and it is raised over a relatively long period of time. In contrast, member loans are from a smaller number of people, smaller number of your members, um, large amounts of money, and raised quickly. And so those two together, member equity and member loans, with the, there are differences between them, are a really valid way to test the level of support coming from your community. Um, and so we will we'll talk a little bit about member loans, but I want to maybe pause at this point and see, Marilyn, if we have some questions. Uh, yes, Bill, we do have a question. Um, Michael John has a question about um, the, the norm as far as cost. And I, um, Michael, I've uh, unmuted you if you want to ask your question. Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes. I can. Yes. 
Uh, I was just curious uh, as far as the cost of uh, individual memberships versus family memberships. Uh, did I see somewhere that they're normally the same, or, or is there uh, more cost for a family to have a membership? Tammy? Sure. You, I, I suggest that you only have one type of membership, and sometimes it's referred to as a household membership, so that um, that household, whoever it is, it's the same cost for them, and they re everyone res has the same benefits. So that okay. household would get one vote. That household would, you know, be eligible to run for the board of directors, and that household would be would receive what other whatever other benefits your co-op decides to structure. But that it's just everybody is at the same level. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. I, I think the, one of the reasons for doing that is to keep the program, the membership program, simple, rather than having lots of different levels. And if there are uh, a household of four people or two people and and they want to I mean they they have the option of uh, you know each of them you know investing in a member share and each of them having a vote so but having just the one category I think keeps it simple we have another question from Dean Dean Hulse uh, you want to ask your question uh, hi I uh was busy writing notes here, and I uh, had uh, had one of my questions answered. I guess the second one now is escaping me that I wrote uh, wrote down. You were asking about uh, what does fully capitalized mean? Yes, that's right. What, yes, what what is fully capitalized? I, I've been uh, given some um, uh, input from someone who's been involved, not necessarily with co-ops in the past, but with uh, with other businesses, and and his comment was. Uh, something to the effect that if you know whatever a consultant says you need for your capital requirements you should triple it <laughs> and so how, how do you know uh, that you really whatever your fully capitalized amount is is really going to be adequate to get you through the, the bumps in the beginning of a yeah. startup yeah I, I like the that advice uh, I, I'd go along with it <laughs> yeah. um, but I, I'd say that during the feasibility and the planning stage uh, most importantly, which is stage two of the uh, of the three stages, that you really do some serious planning work, where you look at the cost of what your project, you know, what it's going to be to start up your co-op and to give you adequate cash reserves for going forward. Uh, part of that includes developing a sources and uses budget and preparing a financial performa and taking that through a number of drafts before you arrive at a point where you are probably able to demonstrate financial feasibility and build the comfort level of all the potential investors and stakeholders. Um, and so being fully capitalized, um, in my view, means that you know by the time you make reach the final decision point, you have all of your capital in place, uh, you know, or you may not have all of your you won't have all 1,000 members by the time you reach the final decision point at the end of stage 3A, uh, but you will be on your way to that. You'll have all your member loans in place. You'll have your, your primary debt and any external subordinated um, financing. All of that will be in place. Uh, generally, we're seeing that the, the cost for startup is in the range of $250, $275 per square foot. Um, it can be done for less in some circumstances, but it also can be more in others. And, th and that, that cost assumes a leasing of a facility rather than the purchase of. So, you know, really sketching out what your capital needs are and uh, not settling for opening your doors until you have the capital in place and, you know, plenty of reserves to get you through the initial three years of where you you may very well be losing money. Okay. Thanks. So we have another question from uh, Bonnie. If you have time for another question right now, Bill. Yes. All yes. right, um, Bonnie, you've been unmuted. Oh, I'm sorry, Bonnie. You need to pull in your uh, pin number in order for me to unmute you. Um, let me ask Bonnie's question. 
What are the typical pushbacks from potential members when selling memberships to people who are used to only investing in stock capital, and how do you respond? Amy, do you want to take that one? Sure. Um, you know, I think um, hopefully you're obviously talking to people that have some interest in having a co-op grocery store in their community. Um, but this is a good climate, actually, um, to talk about that co-ops are, you know, you are investing in something, that you are an owner of a business and you're investing in it. Um, so I think it's, it's actually, um, there's so many more positive aspects to talk about it to people. I, I, I have, I'm not experienced really much pushback. Um, you know, it's more just communicating and educating people that the store is owned by its members, um, the money spent there stays in the community, um, it's an asset to the community. It typically doesn't move out of the community. Um, so there's just so many positive messages that you can tell someone that, I, that the pushback, I, I, I think you could work through that pretty quickly if you did experience that. I think what happens with a lot of startups is that they encounter pushback when potential members say, well, I'll join when you get the store open. and. Mm -hmm. uh, you really have to have a strategy and approach to work through that. And the basic answer is, you know, the store won't open. You know, we might have a co-op, but we won't have a store um, until we have all, you know, of our capital in place. And we need to have, you know, 1,500 members before we open our doors. And if you're going to wait till you open the doors, it might be a long, long, long wait. And so you have to refine that message. Um, and, and you also have to, you know, as you're selling memberships, you need to convey that this member, this capital, at least part of it, is, will be needed, you know, to do the work to get the doors open. Uh, that without it, you will not be able to have the capital or leverage the other capital that you will need. So. so there are a few more questions. Um, some of them are related to external debt, so I think it might be fine for you to go back to your presentation now, and we'll we'll come back to questions in a few minutes. Yeah. Thank you. Um, with member loans, uh, we have a lot of material in here about member loans, and I, I don't think I'm going to go into it in very much depth, other than to say that that the planning for a member loan campaign. Uh, takes at least four to six weeks of fairly steady focus and work. Uh, and then at the appropriate time to launch a member loan drive, uh, it can be done. The goal should be done, should be to try to reach your goal within a four-week period. Uh, don't tell anybody, but give yourself a two-week overrun in case you don't meet that. So. That's four to six weeks of planning, four to six weeks of implementation. Um, and then you will wish to aim to collect the, the loans as soon as possible, at least within 30 days. Um, so if we go back to slide 19 and we look at the, the stages, we see that the member loan um, let me see if I can even use this highlighter here, that the, the uh, member loan planning would happen, planning for the member loan drive would happen in stage 2B. And then once the site is secured with a lease agreement contingent upon getting your financing, which is what the dotted line represents, then you would launch the member loan drive and Stage 3A would want to have all of your member loans collected before you make that final decision, reach that final decision point at the end of stage 3A. The, you can see that by the time you launch a member loan drive, in this example, you have 600 members. And it's recommended that you have close to that, at least that, you know, maybe 400. Uh, but you know, if, if you only have 100 or 200 members, you will probably not have enough to be able to be successful with a member loan drive. Um, 
so and then really setting being clear on setting a goal uh, for member loans and you know how much um, we're seeing existing food co-ops uh, established food co-ops raising between three hundred thousand and a million and a half dollars for uh, their expansion projects and we're seeing startup co-ops raising between three hundred thousand and a million dollars um, and this is a stretch for some people's thinking because initially they might think, well, I, you know, I could loan the co-op $100, but you need to educate your members in terms of the costs um, of, of raising, of opening a, a store and how much you need to, to, to get from member loans. You certainly need to involve legal counsel as you're planning a member loan drive because there are securities issues and finding an attorney who's both familiar with cooperative law and securities law is important. Uh, if you need assistance with that, feel free to contact us. We can help you potentially connect with an attorney that uh, can work in your area um, in, who's skilled in both of those areas. So we're going to go through some of the, um, skip to the member loan thing, but I want to get into the uh, the um, external sources of capital, again, looking at them in two categories, external subordinated and the primary debt first position um, category, and understanding the distinction between this, that the first position will be able to use the whatever collateral you have uh, as security for their position the external subordinated loans would be in a second position or would be unsecured. Um, so in this current economic climate, it's certainly a challenge uh, compared to, you know, it's very different compared to three years or four years ago, and we're, we're seeing that banks are, are not very inclined to be supporting uh, these startup efforts. And so it puts a greater reliance upon the member capital, uh, the capital that you raise through equity or member loans from your members, and then, you know, finding other sources of capital. Um, so I've listed here some of the approaches I would recommend in this time. Um, you know, it's 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 largely a matter of building relationships with lenders. That early on in your project, you begin to talk with them. Uh, you don't go in the door and say, how much can you lend us? But you go in and talk with them and tell your story and get them excited about your project. And, uh, and then as, you, as things progress, as, you're, as you have 1,200 members on board and as you've raised $600,000 and as you're building momentum, you go back and you show them uh, how your vision is becoming a reality. And you, you will, they will likely say no many times. Uh, you know, you have to, that's part of the test. And uh, you may want to go to them and say, well, if you're saying, no, you're not able to lend us money at this time, what would it take uh, for you to be able to make a loan and to get them to articulate that? Um, it's, they might be able to say something that we would lend you a money contingent upon contingent upon the co-op doing A, B, and C. To get, if you can get that from them, that's, that's a great, um, that helps you move forward. Um, purchasing real estate uh, may be a better way to bring collateral into your project as opposed to leasing a site and having to do renovations and improvement on that site that don't uh, serve as collateral to a bank. But if you purchase real estate and then make the improvements, it may be easier to get financing. Uh, of course, it adds to the cost of your project and it adds to the risk and, and certain levels. But being a member consumer-owned co-op, you have the potential to draw in capital that could put you into a position to purchase real estate. Um, the breakdown of the sources by percentage, um, I'm looking at it basically at 
50% at least coming from the owner's contribution, primarily member equity and member loans, 25% from the external subordinated category, and no more than 25% from the first position. Uh, ben from Friendly City Food Co-op can comment a little bit about where they're at, but their current financial performance is projecting that they will have 47% from the owner's contribution and uh, and 15% from the middle category, the gap category, and 38% from their first position. Uh, ben, can you comment just a little bit on your progress on that? Sure, yeah. And um, I'd also like to say one thing briefly uh, in, to respond to some of the earlier questions, especially uh, the pushback in terms of, you know, whether you should be a stock offering versus member loans, that kind of thing. I mean, we encountered a lot of that, and a lot of that is it's great because it makes made us uh, get our story better, made us learn more about what we had to say uh, to really accurately and compellingly represent what we're trying to do. Um, and ultimately, especially you know, in our earlier times, we also ha it taught us that. Um, you want to try to engage people, and you want to try to answer questions and overcome objections, but ultimately keep moving forward, because some of those people will come back to you later once they see other people have gotten involved, and there are other people who want to get involved right now. So we didn't get too hung up on spending a ton of time overcoming some objections. But to go directly to the financing side, we went to local banks. We went to um, National banks that had local offices also are uh, the credit union that we're currently banking with um, to try to get the uh, the primary loan without a lot of success. Uh, the credit union was most interested in working with us, and especially with the U the potential of a USDA loan guarantee, um, which we do on paper qualify for. And they were you know they were willing to put a lot of effort into trying to make that all work. The USDA program is really complicated and actually can be pretty expensive. There are points associated with it that have to be paid, plus there's other processing fees and in some cases even additional consulting fees. Um, we got really, really super mega lucky in that uh, right after our last member general membership meeting last uh, early October, um, the day after that, a member who I don't know, uh, really nobody knew uh, from the board other than one person had a kind of a distant professional relationship with. This member called that person who he had the professional relationship with and said that he was interested in making a substantial loan. So we, that other board member who he contacted and I and this lender, we uh, sat down with our lawyer and he asked what we wanted to get from the bank. We told him what that number was. At that time, it was $484,600. And he said, OK, that's what I want to loan you. And the advantage for us, of course, was that his rate is much more favorable than the bank was going to offer us. Uh, and he's certainly a more flexible, more, uh, you know, uh, he's a more flexible guy who really supports the concept of the co-op and uh, really wants to see it happen in his community. and. At first, you know, we were, as you can imagine, totally blown away by this person coming forward to do this. But I guess I would, you know, encourage people to be open to it and to put the word out there that people can do this because, you know, his explanation was perfectly reasonable. He has wealth, and he would much rather put it someplace where he can see it and where it serves his community rather than, you know, giving it to a manager in some big city somewhere else who couldn't care less what happens in this you know, in his own hometown. So uh, that worked out great for us. And we still, you know, uh, we have the initial paperwork signed with him. We have continuing to adjust the paperwork and make amendments, especially as our principal financing needs change. Uh, but he seems pretty amenable to that, to increasing his loan uh, accordingly. And it was a huge help in being able to get the member loans moving forward. Um, we still haven't really hit our critical mass where those seem to get a little easier, but we're getting there and we're working very hard on that. And, and so this uh, person is re requested to be anonymous in yes, the they, community. Yeah, they, they requested total anonymity, so we actually had to prepare paperwork for the board 
because the board, of course, had to approve this, but his name was removed from all the paperwork. He was just referred to as lender. So only, only our lawyer and uh, the other board member and I know who he is. And, uh, and this is outside of the member loan program, as I understand. Correct. This replaces our principal financing because he is the first position lender. He has all the collateral. Um, so yeah. correct. We really, at this point, we could not go to a bank because we don't have the ability to give them any security any longer because he has taken that. But yeah. we felt that was a risk worth taking. Yeah, and you're still assembling all of your capital, and this isn't everything's not. It's not a. You, you've not reached your no turning back point yet. No, absolutely not. You know, we still have almost four hundred thousand dollars from the member loans. We have a little more of the uh, member equity from the, you know, ownership shares, the membership shares, and some more of the community uh, grants and such. Um, but really, for us, the big challenge now is the member loans. You, you've cleared a num number of hurdles and passed a number of tests, but you've got a few more big ones to go. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, Marilyn, do we have more questions? Uh, yes, we have a question from Amanda, that, who I opened up right now because it relates to this um, conversation you're having. Uh, sh they're hitting uh, brick walls. And, are, and Amanda, do you want to chime in? Yeah, or? thank you. Sure. Um, I just wonder whether banks you know, in the current economic climate, are any banks lending any money to start up co-ops? We have tried every bank in town. We've tried the USDA, but we can't go forward with that until we get a bank to loan us the money. Um, so we're kind of getting a bit frustrated. Are there yeah. any other alternatives we should be looking at? Well, uh, it, it's, I understand your, your position and your frustration. It's very difficult. Um, you know, I'm hearing from some other startup efforts that they've, you know, made presentations to, you know, you know, eight banks and they're, you know, they're waiting for a, a response and they, they've got some interest from some and so you begin to hear about if someone will take the lead, can you put together a consortium of, of local banks to kind of divide the risk and one of the local banks might take a lead position and, you know, organize the other local banks but it would be in at a, at a each bank would be in a smaller amount, um, and there's some incentive for what is it the, the CRE Community Reinvestment Act or something that uh, CRA that that banks are required to invest certain monies into their local communities, and this type of um, project can help them qualify and fulfill their quota in that area. So some banks are interested in that, but. You're going to hear no, you know, my question for you would be how many times have you heard no from the same bank? Uh, right, well, we haven't I, got to the, yeah, we haven't got to the 10 yet. Uh -huh. I guess we'll just have to keep trying. And, you know, we'd love to be in Ben's position and have a benefactor come forward. I mean, that's like your dream scenario, isn't it? So. Well, it is. And, and we're seeing a number of, in some other communities where there are examples of this. And this is not the, you know, the situation that Ben described is not the only example of this. There are some other examples that are they're a little different, but it's somebody else coming in and taking the place of the bank in the first position. And whether that's a developer or a real estate developer, um, you know, or a, a, a consortium of local banks, you know, there are. You just have to kind of keep pushing at it, and you know, we'll be glad to work with you on this and strategize. Uh, around ways to pursue this. Uh, I, I strongly encourage talking to credit unions also. Our credit union made it clear that in order to do a loan of our size that they would be doing it as a consortium with other credit unions and that they did this routinely. So they, would, they were actually the ones who were going to take our total loan amount to other credit unions that they make loans with and make that happen. So credit unions I think are more they understand the concept of co-ops better, and they're a little more open to it. Um, one other thing about this benefactor, it is, you know, it, it, it's, it's amazing, but I, you know, we're not a community that, we're not a wealthy community at all. Demographically, we're really not an ideal co-op community. So it's not like we're Burlington, Vermont, or someplace that kind of has more wealth and has more people who are hip to co-ops. So it can happen. You know, it can happen even in unlikely places. Yeah. Okay, thank you. 
we're uh, nearing the end. Here on the on the call, who would like to get that fellow's phone number, Ben? Yeah, well, he's anonymous. I can't give you that. <laughs> I got you. Um, there's a a lot more questions, Bill. I've got um, one from a uh, Bob Noble uh, next. Bob, yeah. you've got the floor. Hi, Bob. Hi. I guess I put in like three or four questions. I'm not sure which one you want me to ask. Um, I was thinking the one on real estate might be the right one for where we are right now. Okay. Uh, so I guess that in some ways um, it makes sense for startups to consider purchasing their property because of the uh, you know economic climate with real estate. You know, it's it's a better deal than it was a few years ago. But given the difficulty. With, uh, is this the right question? <laughs> Given the difficulty with getting the, the banks to lend money and, and capitalizing financing in, in general, that, that it's starting to think, I'm starting to think maybe, you know, to tell the, some of the startups in, around Philadelphia here that uh, it's, it's a better, easier way to go just to, to try to lease the property, at least initially, you know, and maybe once you get going, then think about purchasing it later on. Yeah, if you had an option to purchase, that would be fine. I mean, I think you have to explore all options at this point. Um, and you know, I've I've seen a few co-ops, startup co-ops, that it became strategically an advantage for them to purchase their real estate. So, um, but it's one size doesn't fit all, and you know, you have to look at all options here. Um, we are nearing the end of our time. Uh, is that correct, Marilyn? Uh, yeah, I have Betsy Black on from uh, Co-op Fund in New England. Betsy, if you you have about maybe 15 seconds. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. I just wanted to give people a heads up to also check out community development financial institutions that might serve your market. Those are mission-driven, nonprofit, usually banks. The Co-op Fund of New England lends to co-ops in New England, but there are other options around the country, and you can find it um, on the Internet. Yeah, these are the where you have to be creative and search out examples like this for this external subordinated category. Um, um, even some of them may be in the in the primary uh, first position. So, uh, well, we're nearing the end of our time, and I thank you all for being with us. And sorry we couldn't get to all of your questions. The slides contain more information than what we were able to work through here today. And uh, Marilyn, I'm going to turn it over to you for the last little wrap-up. OK, you want to move forward in the slides then, Bill. So here's our contact information. And uh, then we have the upcoming webinars. Now the next uh, webinar will be Choosing a Location, two weeks from today, Tuesday, March 16th. If you're not signed up for that one, uh, please do. Once again, there will be a recording of this session that will be posted on our website. You can access that through cdsconsulting.coop. On the left toolbar, look under News and Events. And from there, it should be pretty clear where to go. Um, and immediately following this session, in just a minute or less, there will be an evaluation. Please take time to fill that out. Uh, it really helps us know what topics you're looking for and how we can best be of service. Um, so four more uh, webinars in this series. And then depending on your feedback, we may very well have another series to continue the conversation. So thank you, Bill. Thank you, Tammy. Thank you, Ben. We appreciate all of your participation today.